Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. Um, my name is Anne Marie Medina, and I am the Director of Corporate and Community Relations for the University of Arizona Health Sciences here in Tucson. And we also have Caroline Berger, who serves in that position up at our Phoenix campus, and Allison Otu, who is our Executive Director. I'd like to share a little bit of information with you about our University of Arizona Health Sciences. We have this wonderful video that was made for us, so I will share that with you now. Welcome to the University of Arizona Health Sciences. As the statewide leader in biomedical research and health professions training, health sciences includes College of Medicine Tucson, College of Medicine Phoenix, College of Nursing, College of Pharmacy, and the Mellon Unit Zuckerman College of Public Health. Together, they provide cutting edge health education, breakthrough research, and a diverse offering of community outreach services. In the heart of health sciences, our employees, nearly 5,000 along with 4,000 students, makes us one of the top employers in the state. Our research and education programs are offered on two campuses, one at the main campus in Tucson and the other in the heart of downtown Phoenix on the biomedical campus. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is a major contributor to U Arizona's well-earned reputation as one of the country's top research institutions. And each year, we receive more than $200 million in research grants and contracts, providing vital funding to help address some of our most critical healthcare challenges. We are grateful for this support, which is fueling discoveries and treatments in areas including cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and now COVID-19. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is also in a unique position to affect change in a rapidly shifting healthcare landscape. As part of our strategic plan, we have developed a set of initiatives to reshape the future of healthcare. We are focusing our efforts on five important areas. Next generation education, precision healthcare for all, making wellness ageless, creating defenses against disease, and new frontiers for better health. These strategic initiatives, we have unprecedented opportunities to excel in education and research in more and better ways than ever before. We invite you to join us on this journey. Please know that our dedicated corporate and community relations team is here to be your connector with health sciences. Thank you for your dedication and for all that you do to make our communities healthy. Well, we also would love for you to follow us on all our social media platforms. And please follow me at A Medina Wildcat on Twitter. If you do post something, make sure you use that hashtag Wellness Wednesdays AZ so we'll be able to track it. Uh, if you have a question today, we'd love to hear from you. So please just drop that in the chat and I'll make sure and ask our presenters those questions after their presentation. And don't forget about those post session emails you're gonna get. They'll have your evaluation, all the links and resources, the video link and links to all of our past sessions. So make sure you look out for that in the next day or so. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenters for the day. First, we have Laura Morehouse, who is the Community Outreach Coordinator of the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center. She has served her in her current role since 2016, where she provides community education and outreach on poison prevention, medication management, bites and sting safety, and more. Laura received her Master of Public Health degree from the University of Arizona with an emphasis in health behavior, health promotion, and is a certified health education specialist. We also have a, joining us Dr. Reem al Sultan, who graduated in 2018 from pharmacy school at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Reem completed a postgraduate pharmacy residency in hospital pharmacy and emergency medicine for two years and is currently a clinical toxicology fellow in the Clinical Toxicology Fellowship Program at the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center. Welcome, Laura and Reem. Great, thanks for having us. Give me one second to get this going. Okay. So again, my name is Laura Morehouse and I am joined by Dr. Reem. 
And we're going to talk about cleaning out your medicine cabinet, sort of a New Year's resolution that's really easy to get done here in January. And a little bit more important now that we're in the COVID pan pandemic as well. So without further ado, let's get going. So very quickly, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about why it's important to clean out your cabinet. We'll briefly touch on expiration dates and whether they're important and what you should do if one of your medications has expired. We'll talk about safe medicine disposal, all the different ways that you can get rid of unused or unwanted medications, including things like creams and supplements. And then very briefly, we'll talk about essential items to keep in stock, things that you should have on hand, just the basics. Of course, every medicine cabinet will look a little bit different, but the things that you might want to have on hand in case of an emergency. And then I'll just talk about the Arizona Poison Center very quickly, and then we'll have time for questions. So to get started, why should we clean out the medicine cabinet? I've broken this down into a couple different scenarios that you can think about while we talk about it. So the first one is that unused or expired medication is a public safety issue. It's something that we do worry about and are concerned about here in the community. It can lead to accidental poisoning, and that's kind of where the poison center comes into place. It can lead to over overdoses, and it can lead to misuse of those medications. So the first one is the non-medical use of prescription drugs ranks second only to marijuana as the most common form of drug abuse in America. And that's in two different ways. The first one is teenagers. Um, almost half of teenagers, I believe it's about 47%, said that they misused prescription drugs um, and they got them from friends or family or the home medicine cabinets. And I've actually heard this from a couple different groups. It could be an older neighbor taking their medications. And then when she isn't looking, the teenage boy next door who does odd jobs for her or runs errands for her, pockets some of those for later. Perhaps he takes them to school, perhaps he takes them to himself. So that's one example of how diversion can actually prevent those medications from being recirculated into our communities. And the second one is more for our older adults. It's easy for someone who is sick, confused, perhaps they can't see well, to take the wrong medicine or an expired medicine. And a good example of that is perhaps an older gentleman um, has developed some problems with sight and he can't read well anymore. He has trouble distinguishing among the many medications and pill bottles in his bathroom, and he um, suffers additional medical problems because he takes the wrong drug. And we actually do see this quite commonly. Some people might mistake their eye drops for their ear drops, or even worse, their eye drops or ear drops for things like glue that have a similar container. So we want to make sure we're cleaning out the cabinet to prevent all of these public safety issues. And then we have children. So accidental pediatric exposure to medications is probably the top call that we, hear, we have here at the Arizona Poison Center. So keeping unused medicine in the home can create a serious health risk. If you have children, if you're taking care of someone else's children, if you're grandparents, pediatric exposure is a big problem. So accidental exposure to medicine in the home is a major source of those unintentional child poisonings in the US. And then each year, approximately 60,000 emergency department visits and 450,000 calls to poison centers are made after children under the age of six, which is kind of the big portion of that population. It's children under six. They find and swallow that medicine without caregiver oversight. And this can be due to a lot of different things. It could be caregiver distraction, unsafe storage, um, and then not getting rid of the medicine in the proper way. So I'm gonna pass it over to Reem to talk a little bit about expiration dates. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Reem Al-Sultan and thank you so much for having me today. So today I will talk about why expiration, why checking expiration dates is important and how to do that. And also we'll talk about like how to dispose um, medications. So let's start first with the expiration dates. Why checking expiration dates is important here. Um, so any medications like with time, uh, the potency and the efficacy of the drug is going to decrease with time, especially if it's past the expiration date. So after that, especially like if it's prescription drug or uh, prescription medications for blood pressure, for cholesterol, with time, if it's past the expiration, it's not going to be effective anymore. And sometimes um, the, uh, the medications might be even uh, harmful to the patients. So because of that, checking expiration dates is very important. And it has to be on everything, whether if it's on over-the-counter or on any other medications or prescription uh, drugs, whether if it's like um, supplements, vitamins, or like creams or ointments, or if it's like an eye drops or ear 
drops as well. It's very important, especially with the eye drops, because we don't want to irritate the eyes. We don't want to like put any like um, harmful uh, materials in the eyes since it's very sensitive. Next slide, Laura. Yeah, so um, the question here, how to uh, check the expiration date? What's the best way to do it? Uh, there is like a rule of thumb, which is one year of checking. So if you have a bottle um, from the um, from the pharmacy, the, the like any prescription drug from pharmacy, always, always count 12 months or one year. After one year, this drug is not supposed, you don't supposed to use it anymore and you should um, like this, uh, like um, dispose it or discard it. And other like condition or other case where you have to um, also discard your medications, if there is any change in the color, if there is any change in the smell, or sometimes if there is anything that happened in the house, like if there is an increase in temperature, if there is like a concern of fire, those things also can affect the medications and change its purity or change its efficacy. So it's important to double check that, it's important to uh, discard these medications. What, whenever you feel like there is something wrong with the smell, something wrong with the color. And uh, also there is another condition uh, when there is like um, unmarked containers, when you have a containers that doesn't have an expiration date or doesn't have a, enough information at this point, it's better to be safe and just discard the medications. And always, always make sure that the medication in a safe place that's um, that's like out of reach for any children as well as any pets, and to be, keep it in a cool and dry place, and not to be in moist uh, like place. And again, as I mentioned, if there is any changes in the climate or the environment inside the house, uh, always always discard those medications. And now I will talk about how to dispose medications in a safe way. There are like multiple ways when we can dispose the medications in a safe and effective way to, uh, to make sure that we are safe as well as our environment. So uh, for the safety, why we have, uh, why we need to make sure that we dispose those medications um, and like in a safe way, first we need to protect our environment because we don't want to like pollute our drinking water. We want we don't want to like um, uh, affect other people. We, also, we want to uh, like uh, protect our community. We don't want like those medications, especially the prescription medications, to be misused by other or like unintentionally going to be reached by uh, children. And also, as Laura told me, you don't want to have Alina to be in drug. <laughs> so also we need to protect our wildlife. So as I mentioned, there are several uh, safe ways to dispose your medications, like using the drug take back programs, uh, using the local take back events. There are certain events that we're going to talk about it in a few minutes, using the Terra bags and the last way or the last uh, option is to dispose medication at home and I'll, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. First, there are like uh, a drug take back programs that um, organized uh, by the DEA and uh, those programs provide safe as well as effective methods for disposal. However, we need to make sure that which medication can be taken for this program, with those programs, some medications, you can't like um, dispose it or give it uh, to those programs. Some of the medications, usually any tablets, capsules, pills, uh, whether if it's like prescription or over the counter, those are usually accepted. However, there are certain medications that are not accepted by this program, such as liquid medications, um, any inhalers, uh, syringes, uh, the EpiPen for allergy or for anaphylaxis reaction, and creams. Those uh, type of medications shouldn't be uh, like given to the drug take back programs. And we're going to talk about it, how the best way to dispose uh, those type of medications. So why 
why it's important to dispose uh, these medications or what happened exactly after we dispose them. So as I mentioned, it's important because we need to protect our environment as well as our community. But how, what happened exactly with those tablets or those like capsules after you give it to, those, uh, to this program? So, um, so the, um, I think here someone said you can hear, let's see. I can still hear, did you get your sound back? Okay. You're fine, I'm fine. Okay. go ahead and continue. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I just wanna make sure. Yeah, uh, so what happened exactly to those pills or capsules after you give it to the program? Usually the, uh, they're gonna be incinerated and coordinated with the DAA and um, by using high temperature, that to make sure that there is no pollution to the air, to the water or our environment. That's why we have to be careful with the inhalers and I'm gonna talk about it in a few minutes. Next slide. Yeah, so now I'm gonna leave you with Laura. Yes, sorry, yeah. my unmute button was not working. Okay, so to find some of these drug take back sites, I'm going to show you the ADHS, the Arizona Department of Health Services disposal dashboard. So they use some GIS technology to give you a really cool interactive dashboard that shows you where some of these drug drop off locations are. And again, these are all in coordination with the DEA. So I'm going to just pull out really quick and I'm going to show you this very cool bit, uh, map. So if you go to azdhs.gov and you search dump the drugs AZ, you're going to find this great map. I'll show you the top. So this is their interactive map. You enter your address here and then if you hit enter, you'll find the ones nearest you. So I'll put in and you can pull up here on the right side. So I'm just going to do our office down in Tucson. And it's gonna give you some of the closest ones. So the closest one to us would be at the Banner um, Hospital. But if you scroll out, you can actually search and find locations nearby. Typically, you're going to see these either at hospitals and the hospitals sometimes have different restrictions on who can come in and who can dispose. But typically it's going to be police departments and sheriff departments. Now this one only shows ones that have been submitted to the system. So if you do have a drug take back location near you that you know is operating, feel free to take your medicines there as well. This is not all of the locations in Arizona completely, but it's a really good place to start. If you're in Pima County, you can also use something called Disposamed. They have their own map that's really good as well. And that's a local coalition in Pima County. So check with your county and see if there's other options as well. But for a statewide option, Dump the Drugs AZ, really great. And you'll see I have a Walgreens selected. A lot of the Walgreens will have 24-7 boxes. So you can actually drive up and dispose of those at any time. So coming back. So that's just one option. And then as Reem was saying, there are local take back events. So the two, and I, since we're based in Pima County, I like to talk about Pima County a little bit more. So you might have to check your county health department if you're somewhere else, but the DEA has a nationwide take back day. Those typically occur in April and October. And I'll show you their website as well really quick because they do also have options for searching your local area. And then Pima County, again, has Disposamed. It's a local coalition that's run through the Pima County Health Department, and they do have a website that you can view as well at disposamed.pima.gov. So I'm going to show you the DEA website. One second. So this is the Take Back Day website. So they do have a collection site locator as well. If you can't find something through the Dump the Drugs website, you can feel free to look at their collection site locator. And then when they do have the Take Back Day, you'll usually be able to find which sites and locations near you are actually participating in this event. It is voluntary. So make sure you check and see who's participating. Okay. And back we go. And then that next option that Reem said is the Tura bags. Now there are other options. There are other brand names that have the same sort of idea and really they're drug deactivation systems. So um, the Tura is not the only one. It's just, we have these in stock. And so I like to talk about them. I have one here. If you look at the video, 
So they use an organic proprietary activated carbon and their purpose is to deactivate drugs. And the cool thing about these is that they take pills, you can put liquids into these, or you can even put patches like fentanyl patches into these um, products. So what you would do is you would tear off the seal, you'd place whatever sort of medicine you have into the pouch, you'd fill it halfway with water, seal it, shake it up a little bit, and then you can actually throw these into the trash can. Um, so they're really handy right now during the pandemic when you probably don't want to be going out to disposal locations. And they're also really handy for people that might have restrictions on transportation or some other um, thing that is causing them not to be able to dispose of properly. So a really great option, the Tura bags. I believe you can find these typically at Walmarts. Um, that might have changed, but we also have them here at the Poison Center. Um, but very handy way to dispose of, especially right now. Now, if you don't have access to any of these previous options, we're going to show you some safe disposal at home. But first, let's talk about needles and syringes, because we tend to get a lot of questions about how to safely dispose of these. Now needles and syringes, you cannot just throw in the trash and you really don't want to try flush those down the toilet. So what can you do? You want to get a nice tough puncture proof plastic container, think a laundry detergent container with a screw on lid and you can dispose of your needles and syringes in that. Once that syringes container gets about three fourths of the way full, you're going to want to label the container with do not recycle. So you can use duct tape and a Sharpie for that. Secure the lid with duct tape, make sure it's screwed on and then extra layer of security with some duct tape. And then you can throw that in the trash can. Do not recycle those containers that goes into the trash. Now liquid medications are kind of the same way. You wanna pour those into a watertight container. So you can think of empty Tupperware, you can think of an empty butter tub as it says on the screen. Anything that will seal and is watertight will be okay. You're gonna to wanna to mix that medication with something that's not desirable. So think used coffee grounds, kitty litter, even dirt will work. Mix it up, secure that lid with duct tape again, and then throw that in the trash can. Very important not to um, recycle those. Now, if any of those had the prescription label, you wanna make sure that you scratch out all of your personal information and then dispose of that as well. So scratch out personal information, take it off of the container, and then you can throw that away too. While we're talking about sharps, some additional recommendations to keep in mind is to keep that plastic container out of sight of reach outside and reach of children and pets. So make sure no one has access to those syringes that have been disposed of. Do not use a glass container. Um, those can shatter very quickly and then that is a hazard. Never put loose needles or syringes in the trash can. Again, make sure they're in this puncture proof container. Do not throw needles and syringes just into a plastic bag um, because they can poke through and then you're causing some sort of harm to come to people that collect the garbage. Don't put them into blue barrels or with any recycling containers. And then again, never flush needles or syringes down the toilet. Yes, that has happened. And then Reem's gonna talk about this FDA flush list. Yeah, yeah so um, as Laura talked to you about the safest way to dispose certain medications. However, the FDA has a flush list for certain medications where we, you need to dispose them as soon as possible because they have high risk for misuse and they might result in death, such as fentanyl, uh, morphine, buprenorphine, which is the like suboxone. So all this medication has high risk. So if uh, if there is a children uh, like use it and or the pet uh, use it, we might result in respiratory depression. Patient can breathe, and that might lead to death. Because of that reasons, those only um, medications within the FDA flush list that you can dispose them or discard them in the flush or flush them immediately. Other uh, medication or other like um, um, like uh, medications such as inhalers that need to be um, disposed in a certain way. So because they uh, they contain sometimes uh, some sort of gases or nitrogens, and if you dispose them uh, with the um, for like the DA with the other food, the drug back programs, they use the uh, the the high like temperature, which might lead to dangerous. Um, events such as explosion. Because of that, they consider as a hazardous waste. So you need to drop them in a specific hazardous waste facility and that you can contact any like local trash and recycling facility for more information about how to dispose them or whether they can accept uh, inhalers or not. So it's very important that you know that it's like 
part of the hazardous weight. Now I just want to talk now about what medications that you can store in your house and that can, you need it as essential medications. So especially now with the, with the winter and um, uh, with the flu and the cold is high now, so you can store like some cough and congestion medications or uh, like um, even medications or syrup, some anti-itching creams or ointments. Also, you can use or store some pain relief medications such as uh, acetaminophen, uh, ibuprofen or aspirin. Uh, also, you have to make sure that overall, like you store them in uh, an appropriate way. It has to be in a dry, um, dry and cool place. And if it need to be in the refrigerator, also you need to store it in the refrigerator. All right. And then some of the other medicine cabinet essentials that you might want to have on hand, things like antacids, either with calcium carbonate or magnesium, whatever works best for you. Because we're in Arizona, you definitely want some sunscreen and they do recommend at least SPF 30. Once you go over SPF 30, they've found that it's maybe just as effective. So at least SPF 30, higher if you want to. And then you should always have a first aid kit and that should have things like bandages, a thermometer, some sort of antiseptic, sterile dressings, tweezers, and eye wash solution. So these are just the very basics to have in your medicine cabinet along with your prescription medicines, any vitamins you might take, and then any supplements that you have as well. Make sure to store all of these out of reach and sight of kids and um, pets. So they should be in a high locked up area where no one can get access to them. And then very quickly, just to push the poison center, we are a 24 seven hotline for poisonings and information. So if you just have questions, you can call us as well. All of our staff are pharmacists, which I'll talk about in just a second. But the cool thing is that we're free. So it doesn't cost anything to call. We're open 24 seven. So you could call us at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. Someone's gonna be there and everything is kept confidential. And then our staff, um, pharmacists. So we do have licensed pharmacists that are on the phone lines and they have additional certification as specialists in poison information. We do have medical toxicologists on staff as well. These are on call board certified medical toxicologists. Um, they're specialized MDs who are available 24 seven to provide guidance um, for our pharmacists and other people. We have genetic counselors that run Mother to Baby Arizona, which is for pregnancy and breastfeeding information. And when we do have public educators for community outreach and education, as well as professional educators that teach students and um, fellows. All right, I think we ended just in time. If you have questions or clarifications, again, please put them into the chat. We'll have a period right now to answer those questions. And if you need any contact information, feel free to grab that as well. This is recorded, so if you need to go back and look at it, you can. So I'm going to stop the share in one second and hand it back over to Anne Marie. Thanks so much, Laura. And yes, we will uh, be um, sharing the link for this presentation, but we'll also include in the email all of the links that you shared in your presentation, Laura. So thank you. We do have a couple of great questions. Someone was wondering about the doTERRA bags, if they are free at the Poison Center and do you, can you mail them or do people need to come by and pick them up? Great question. So I am actually in the process of creating a survey link so that people can put in their information and we can mail them for free. Uh, they are for free. We typically have them at events, but because of COVID, obviously we haven't had any of them. Um, so I will send you the link to that survey, Anne-Marie, and then um, okay. you can distribute that freely. And yes, they are medium-sized pouches. So they usually fit about 45 pills and then six ounces of liquid. Um, so great. we will have them available very shortly. Great. We'll put that survey link in with the follow-up email. Great, also, you. other a question was, um, would storing your medications in the fridge extend their effectiveness past their expiration date? Reem, that's for you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, actually it doesn't. So as I mentioned, like always, always make sure if you're not sure about the expiration date, it has to be one year which is the one year like rule of thumb. Uh, after that, it's not uh, like um, like valid or like uh, we shouldn't use it anymore. Okay. Another question we had is when you say to store them in a cool and dry spot, medicine cabins are typically in a bathroom where it tends to be steamy sometimes. Yeah. Is that still the safest place to store medications? As long as the box or the, the way how you store it is like, dry and cold, it's fine. 
But if it's not like secure or if it's not like locked very well, I wouldn't like store it in the lab. So open shelving is not good. Closed yeah. medicine cabinets are exactly. fine. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, and we do recommend having some sort of locked box, especially if you have children yes. or pets. And that usually people keep them in the kitchen above the fridge or something like that. So where it might not be humid and wet. Right. One of the things that you didn't mention, but I know that has been very helpful. You were talking about um, older adults and taking the incorrect medications or things, um, making sure that, that they're placed in pouches that the pharmacies can do, that they get their daily pills so they know, or in a medicine box where their dailies are out so that they make sure that they're taking the correct medications. I think that's really helpful for caregivers to know that those help solve a lot of problems, so. We do recommend keeping something like a medication calendar so you can check off and you know, posting on the fridge or using pill minders. And there's even apps on the phone that you can use now for that. Well, thank you both so much. This was extremely informative. I know that people got a lot of great information and we really appreciate it. We also appreciate all the time and effort you're doing manning that COVID helpline and uh, taking all those calls. I know there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of uh, anxiety out there. So thank you both so much for all that you do. Thank yeah, you, Emory. Thank you for having us. Okay. So again, thank you to our two presenters today, doc, uh, Dr. Reem and, and Laura for presenting for us today. We really appreciate that. We'll get all that information out to you. And uh, next week we've got, uh, well, not next week, in two weeks, we've got our next session, uh, February 10th, uh, Dr. Shad is back and that's Dr. Farshad Marvasti. He's been with us before. He's because it's heart month in February, he's going to be talking about using food and lifestyle as medicine to keep your heart healthy. So specifically focusing on the heart. So make sure you sign up for that one. Um, also, just a reminder for those of you who have gone to our Connect to STEM event um, up in Phoenix, where we've gone virtual this year, as most things have, and uh, we have our kickoff this Saturday. So make sure you get registered for that. I'll send you the link. We've got some great uh, presentations that day. We've got the five-year-old mannequin who helps train our future doctors. We've got some uh, great performances by the Be Kind crew. Our special neurosurgeon, Dr. Alan Hamilton, who heads up our Aztec Center, is going to be uh, doing a great presentation talking about Aztec and everything they do for virtual reality and augmented reality to help train our, our physicians. So lots of things going on. And don't forget, when you register, you are uh, entered to win that iPad. So you want to do that. So again, on behalf of all of us here at the University of Arizona Health Sciences, we thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in two weeks or on Saturday for Connect STEM. And as always, bear down, mask up, and vax up. See you later.